很久以前，它是印第安人的土地。四百年前，它是荷兰人的一道墙。年前，它是梧桐树下的金融种子；一百年前，它塑造了美国的崛起。今天，它是一张洒向世界的金融之网。这张网强大又脆弱，光明又黑暗。这张网既能让经济加速，又能让经济窒息。它就是华尔街。There was no Wall Street in the sense that we understand it. It only began in the 1790s. That's the Buttonwood Agreement. It was signed under a buttonwood tree on Wall Street. 63 Wall Street is the address. The tree came down in the 1860s, I believe. Wall Street's entrance is the Saint Paul's Cathedral. The cathedral has a stone altar. A man named Alexander Hamilton chose to spend the night here. But Hamilton said the national debt properly managed would be a national blessing. This was a kind of a strange view for the 18th century. Most people thought that debt was a bad idea. I think it shows how modern Hamilton was. He knew that this would be a great advantage to the United States in the future. 200 years ago, Hamilton is the road on this road, the road that guides the Hudson River to the present day. Come on, sugar. 六十七岁的丹姆一直生活在中部的肯塔基州，并且拥有着属于自己的养殖场。Oh, baby sucking. Yeah, you sucking your mama, aren't you? 许多美国人和他们的移民祖先一样，把这种贴近土地、朴素而勤恳的生活作为一种精神寄托，一直携带到今天。今天的美国，绝大部分的土地依然保持着这样的面貌。纽约的清晨，有着完全不一样的生活。I feel blessed every time I come down here. I mean, it's just a great career to be in. You know, it's afforded me a lot of things. If I ever left Wall Street, I don't know. I mean, I, I'd probably live and die right here on Wall Street, really. Iron, 今年五十一岁，在纽交所已经工作了三十三年。自二零零八年以来，艾伦和华尔街上的人遭遇到了尴尬和质疑。Unfortunately, there are some in the financial industry who are misreading this moment. Instead of learning the lessons of Lehman and the crisis from which we're still recovering, they're choosing to ignore those lessons. I'm convinced they do so not just at their own peril, but at our nation's. You can't sort of point to one sector like Wall Street and say it caused the crisis. Uh, Congress may be involved, the regulators, you know, Congress sort of pushed for the government agencies to help more poor people buy houses. But if everybody's invested and made, and nobody lost money, then the system cannot work because the only way you're going to have a, a market develop is for some people to be successful 
and other people to fail. That's by nature of life. Otto, what's that once more? Parity's still 2880. Parity's still 2880 on that. Right. In the Washington State of the United States, 华盛顿从来不曾像现在这样密切关注自己的一举一动。Hey, just let me know if that changes. All right, so he's gonna let me know if it changes. Right. People want to see change. People are fed up with Wall Street this past year. So you're seeing new rules come out of Washington every day, which we're not crazy about, but you expect it. 也许现在的华尔街已经习惯了和政府保持距离，但是。的确，他们曾经非常接近过，甚至于只隔一条马路。一七八九年四月三十日，美国的第一任总统华盛顿就是在纽交所对面的联邦大厅里宣誓就职的。纽约成为了临时的首都，而这个崭新的国家从成立的那一天开始就已经破产了。Washington's army needed to finance itself in the war. Sometimes they would just go and sort of seize food from farmers. We borrowed money from the French and from the Dutch, um, vast amounts from both of them. But they would issue an IOU, and then later on these were converted into bonds. In the Civil War, the federal government and the state government collected more than 5,400 million dollars. 这些债务挑战着新国家的品格和尊严。华盛顿把目光投向了自己的部下，亚历山大·汉密尔顿。Hamilton was could not have been poorer. He was a bastard, and he worked in a in a merchant house, and that's where he learned commerce. He learned about buying and selling. Most of the founding fathers didn't didn't really understand much about buying and selling because they were, you know, they were planter. 这些农场主出身的开国元勋们。只能想到通过多印纸币来解决问题。汉密尔顿认为，如果用通货膨胀到严重贬值的货币来偿还债务，那么这个已经一无所有的国家还将永远失去国家信用，不能再借到钱。三十三岁的财政部长汉密尔顿开始筹谋一个计划。既然没有钱来还债，那么。就把债务留下，但是要不失掉信用，要体体面面的留下来。在美国金融博物馆里，记录了一句汉密尔顿在二十四岁时说过的话。And he was quoted、um, in saying、uh, in 1781, a national debt, if it is not excessive, will be to us a national blessing. 汉密尔顿的计划是这样的：财政部面对的是一文不值的货币和五花八门的独立战争债券和借条。首先，财政部发行新货币，手持旧货币的人可以按照票面价格进行一比一的兑换。这样，旧的货币退出了市场，取而代之的是信誉良好的新货币。之后。政府开始发行新债券，而新债券只能用新币来购买，这样新币又回流到财政部。最后，财政部用这笔钱来回购在战争期间的所有债券和借条。至此，旧账全部还清，政府用新债代替旧债，留住了国家的信用。这个计划被后人形象地称为“旋转门计划”。汉密尔顿需要推动旋转门的第一个力量，而华尔街正等待着与政府的第一次合作。华尔街上的经纪人对财富有着最敏锐的嗅觉。虽然旋转门计划还没有被国会通过，但是经纪人们已经开始不动声色地从各州购买旧货币，而收购的价格是票面价格的十分之一。
华尔街将会全力以赴地配合汉密尔顿的计划。只有这样，经纪人们低价囤积的旧货币才能真正转变为巨大的财富。他对人性洞若观火。汉密尔顿相信，人类有利己的天性，这种天性很难改变。但明智的立法者可以审慎地使之改道，造福大众。绝大多数人，一方面有利己心，另一方面有同情心。设计一个制度的时候，你要求每一个人都是。毫不利己，专门利人，这是这是一种空想啊！汉密尔顿的旋转门计划在国会遇到了很大的阻力，反对的力量主要来自另一位开国元勋托马斯·杰斐逊。Thomas Jefferson had a very different background from Alexander Hamilton. His father was very rich. His father died when he was only like four or five years old, and he inherited.、Um, Several hundred slaves and thousands of acres of, of tobacco land in Virginia.、Uh, he was one of the richest people in the country、um, when he was young. 一七七六年的初夏，作为独立宣言的主要起草人之一，杰斐逊来到费城独立厅对面的这间小旅馆。几天后，宣言的第一稿就在这里完成了。他写道。人人生而平等，造物者赋予他们若干不可剥夺的权利，其中包括生命权、自由权和追求幸福的权利。The United States is a child of England. We inherited our political culture from England. This idea of limited government power and personal power, that is personal liberty, that cannot be interfered with. 杰斐逊反对汉密尔顿的计划。是因为他担心国家的信用与命运会被华尔街的疯狂所操弄。更让他警惕的是，在汉密尔顿的计划中的一个细节，就是各州将不必自己偿还债务，而由联邦政府统一承担。天下没有免费的午餐，权利和义务从来都是对等的。And so Jefferson decided that Hamilton's policies were strengthening the national government too much. Jefferson was sort of, you know, let's have a small central government. 一直以来，美国的建国者们小心地防范着自己亲手建立起来的这个美国。对于中央政府的权力，不是信赖，而是制约。为了控制好它，建国者们甚至在战争结束后。留下了一个松散的联邦，就散了。大家跑回自己的家乡，继续种田过日子。所以，汉密尔顿的旋转门计划挑战了以杰斐逊为首的一大批开国元勋们出发时的共识。反对者们跳过了现实的困境，来直接声讨汉密尔顿的计划是一个危险的黄金圈套。杰斐逊和汉密尔顿之间的分歧搁置了旋转门计划，却形成了美国的两大党派。今天人们熟悉的美国民主党和共和党的诞生，就源于两个人的矛盾。而政府的权力是否应该进入市场的讨论，也由此发端，延续到了二百多年后的今天。二零零九年十月，美国证券业与金融市场协会的年会在纽约召开。财政部长盖特纳的出现，再次引发了关于政府与市场的讨论。But now the government has a much more influential role in that than it has before. In a crisis like this, is you have to have the government go in and do what only governments can do. The next big battle for you is regulation.、Uh, the regulation, we don't use these military terms, but if, since you use them, I'd say it's a,、uh, 
a war of necessity, not a war of choice, and it's a just war. And, uh, and we're going to achieve a strong package of reforms. For the reasons I said, it is, in the, it, is, it is the necessary fair thing to do. How can you tell Americans, look them in the eye, that after going through what they went through and still facing 10% unemployment and this enormous uncertainty about their future, that would leave in place a system that causes as much damage. It's a completely untenable proposition. The Hamilton was very much more of a practical man. He wanted what worked in the real world. Whereas Jefferson was more, this is the way the world should work, therefore we're going to make it work this way, even though, you know, human nature sometimes doesn't allow that to happen. 1787年 出自一本叫《联邦党人文集》的书认为欧洲的革命和流血Jefferson envisioned a world or a country full of yeoman farmers, farmers who owned and worked their own land. Hamilton decided that Amer if America was going to you know, be a strong country in the future, it had to become a manufacturing country. Hamilton saw an industrial revolution coming. Which is why he favored the financial system to finance entrepreneurs, to finance factories. He really didn't understand money. He didn't understand how money worked. He didn't understand how wealth was created. Um, and Hamilton did. New York is not the place of Jefferson. He wanted the United States to be a country that would be able to spread the power of liberty and the liberty of the United States. This vision for the young people of the United States was built on a 1790年初夏,杰斐逊和汉密尔顿都住在华尔街上。汉密尔顿还在游说国会通过他的旋转门计划。而杰斐逊要尽早把美国的政治中心带离这里。两个同样焦虑,同样需要妥协与支持的开国
。现在，每天行走在曼哈顿大街上的美国人，都会看到悬挂在墙上的一个电子显示器，它实时更新着美国的债务总额。二零零八年，美国国债进入十万亿美元时代。二百多年来。这个国家的经济跟随着这些巨大的债务数字，一路走到了世界的最前端。在这本二百多年前的账册里，记录着汉密尔顿上任的四年内，财政部的账。到一七九三年，这个国家共发行了六千四百二十万美元的新国债，足以还清全部旧账。从债务到恩赐的故事，是被汉密尔顿这样完成的。他把债务变成了一种新的金融产品，投向了华尔街。经纪人们使国债的价格不断攀升。一七九四年，美国的债券在欧洲获得了最高的信用等级。从此，欧洲的资本开始漂洋过海，流入了这个年轻的国家。汉密尔顿发行的国债启动了美国，也启动了华尔街。在华尔街上，总有人怀疑华盛顿的动机：政府是想解决危机，还是想？利用危机，华尔街渴望有更多的机会，但危机似乎总是让这条街道失去更多的自由。奥巴马政府在二零零九年六月推出了金融监管新政，二零一零年七月二十一日又签署了金融监管改革法案。这一系列改革把美联储武装成了一个权力空前的全能性监管者，一个最强大的。中央银行。As you can see, the bank no longer functions as a bank, and it's not a building that's open to the public. It was the idea of our first secretary of the treasury, Alexander Hamilton, to have a central. 这间国家独立公园里的仓库，曾经是美国的中央银行。汉密尔顿在一七九一年创建了这家银行。作为联邦政府的财政代理机构和融资机构，来发行国债和国家货币。Not that not that the first bank was Bank of the United States was a regulator, but at least it was a central institution which could have monitored banking. 不过，汉密尔顿创建的中央银行立刻受到了杰斐逊及其支持者的严厉指责。比旋转门计划更让他们无法容忍的是，政府权力开始直接向市场延伸。In the United States, we always had a great fear about concentrations of power, and thus we didn't have a central bank in this country until 1913, until the 20th century. 一八四二年，英国著名的作家狄更斯开始了美国之行。在日记中，他这样写道：“上床睡觉之前，我从住所的窗户向外张望，马路对面有一栋漂亮的白色大理石建筑，呈现出一丝幽灵般的哀伤。”第二天早晨起来，他的大门仍紧紧关闭，空气冰凉。狄更斯看到的。就是在汉密尔顿和杰斐逊的争论之下，最终被关闭的美国中央银行。Well, we, we had no central bank、um, in the United States. It's hard to imagine it, but we didn't. 在此后漫长的时间里，华盛顿和华尔街渐行渐远，政府不再以任何形式管理市场，而在权力真空之下。华尔街的私人金融机构却趁机独揽了美国的金融大权。对于生活在一百多年前的人们来说，
即使是看到了铁轨断裂、蒸汽锅炉爆炸、两列火车相撞，或者更严重的是，也不能阻止他们对于火车这种崭新的力量的幻想与痴迷。失去了中央银行的美国，就像这些激动而失控的列车，虽然仍然以惊人的速度在发展。但却成为了西方世界中最自由、最不稳定的一个经济体。一些华尔街人认为，在美国有双重标准，一个是给华尔街的。另一个是给剩下的整个美国的。You could see what happened when President Obama came to Wall Street a, a, a month, a month and a half ago. He comes down to Wall Street,、uh, somberly gives a speech. People are sitting there shaking his hand afterwards, but nobody's looking very exuberant. The next day, he goes、uh, to a, a automotive、uh, union hall, looking like he's running for re-election. Gives a rousing speech about how he's working for them and. Trying to rein in Wall Street. My point is a, a view of com two completely different presidents there, but it was actually the same man.、Uh, and the way he was pitching it to the country was clearly that Wall Street is not necessarily to be trusted. So I think it's a tough road to hoe here right now. In the long history of the United States, two hundred years of history. 华尔街得到华盛顿信任的时间似乎并不多。一七九九年，一个叫威廉·杜尔的人死在了纽约的监狱里，留下了一张独立战争时期的借条。纽约州的农民把两头奶牛借给了大陆军，而签收的人正是这个死去的囚犯——华盛顿和汉密尔顿信任的战友——威廉·杜尔。今天，在华尔街上，威廉·杜尔这个名字更多的是和美利坚合众国的第一次经济危机联系在了一起。当华尔街还是一条年轻而粗糙的街道时，就被指责充斥着股票骗子和投机分子。一七九二年，一些关于纽约银行的谣言出现在华尔街上，致使这家银行的股票大幅下跌。然后。有人开始偷偷的大量买进，这个人就是威廉·杜尔，谣言也是他散布的。你要用你道德在华尔街的话，你是没有办法生存的。华尔街就是吃你钱的地方，就是掠夺你财富的，而且很冠冕堂皇的掠夺你的财富。这时的威廉·杜尔是汉密尔顿的助理。他的行动源于一条内幕消息：中央银行将收购纽约银行，汉密尔顿将很快着手这个计划，而威廉·杜尔要在此前收购到足以控制纽约银行的股票。他疯狂地四处借钱，最后居然用承诺支付高额利息的方法，向城市里的小业主、车夫、园丁、女佣等普通民众集资。一七九二年三月，威廉·杜尔再也支付不起承诺的利息，他的资金链终于断了。城市里聚集起可怜的投资者，他们咒骂威廉·杜尔是个骗子。泡沫在欲望的挤压下终于破灭，恐惧第一次降临华尔街。从此，每隔大约二十年，就会有类似的贪婪和绝望在这里反复出现。Wall Street's crash in 1792 made Jefferson suspicious even more of Hamilton's policies, whereas Hamilton thought financial crises are、uh, not desirable, but you you can't avoid them if you're going to have economic modernization. Hamilton 向人们解释，在华尔街，值得尊重的股民、券商与无耻的赌徒之间存在着界限，而杰斐逊说。华尔街根本就是人类本性的大阴沟。
一七九二年的这场危机结束两个月后，有二十一个经纪人和三家经纪公司，在华尔街六十三号的一棵梧桐树下签订了一个协议。经纪人们庄严宣誓，并承诺对外交易将收取佣金，彼此交易拥有优先权。一七九二年五月的梧桐树协议，被认为是华尔街最早的自我管理，基本的交易规则开始逐渐形成。华尔街的经纪人们建立起自我约束的证券行业协会，以自律的方式防止危机的发生，从而避免政府的干涉。自此以后，在华盛顿的视野之外，华尔街开始了一个世纪的自我生长。一八九六年五月十一日下午两点，摄影师威廉姆·赫斯用一个叫“摄影机”的设备，第一次捕捉到了现代化的城市生活。城市，沿着汉密尔顿的目光，已经又向前走了一个世纪，他就要到达属于他自己的美国世纪了。就在美国经济一路狂飙突进之际。却有人想到这个国家的未来时，不安到浑身颤抖。他，就是美国第十六任总统亚伯拉罕·林肯。一八六四年，林肯预言，终有一日，我们的财富将集中在个别人的手中，而那时，合众国也将走向灭亡。一九零零年。美国的国民生产总值首次超过英国，成为世界上经济总量最大的国家。这一年，美国证券总值约为六百亿美元，是国民生产总值的三点二倍。以摩根为首的富豪们云集在华尔街，洛克菲勒、梅隆、卡耐基，他们实际上掌控了这个国家的金融权利。离纽约不远的哈特福德，是金融魔术师约翰·皮尔蓬特·摩根出生的地方。摩根相信自己的团队会对国家资本市场进行诚实与适当的管理。在二十世纪初的美国，谁能成为担当这一切的力量呢 ？There was no sense that the government should be doing that here. There was no Federal Reserve for the exact span of Pierpont Morgan's life. So he took that role upon himself. 一九零一年，华盛顿迎来了一个年轻而充满斗志的新总统，西奥多·罗斯福。他强烈的感觉到了，在华盛顿之外，已经形成了另一个强大的权力高地——华尔街。罗斯福总统想把它置于政府的控制之下。然而，华尔街是一个已经习惯了自由的市场。并拥有了自己的力量。摩根，华尔街上最有权势的人物，走进了罗斯福的办公室。摩根问道：“政府在做决定之前，为什么不事先通知华尔街呢？”罗斯福说：“事先对华尔街发出警告，是我们恰恰所不愿意做的事情。”摩根说：“如果我们做错了什么，请派您的人和我的人会谈。”他们可以修正，罗斯福说：“我们不会那么做，我们不愿意修正错误，而是想结束错误。”这是华尔街与华盛顿的第一次正面交锋，政府似乎占据了上风。但是五年后，摩根所带领的华尔街将在金融危机中证明，谁才是强者。今天，麦迪逊大道上的摩根图书馆是一个安静的地方。This room used to have furniture. It used to be the the place where they store the books. They now have downstairs. 摩根的曾孙罗伯特先生说，摩根家族现在已经没有过去那么辉煌了。后代们从事着各种行业，凭借自己的能力而生存。他也从没有过要当银行家的想法。
，但是，在这间曾祖父的办公室里，他还是会感觉到一种模糊不清却浩瀚无边的力量。从十九世纪末开始，美国出现了前所未有的繁荣景象，但是，到一九零七年，美国人开始担忧养老、疾病和就业等问题，他们变得狂躁而焦虑。一九零七年中旬，股市开始暴跌，人们开始争着从银行取出自己的存款。一家信托公司总裁开枪自杀，倒闭和恐慌开始了。And at the time,、uh, the banking community bonded together, led by J.P. Morgan Sr. to right the ship, if you will, to provide liquidity for the marketplace and try to get. Uh, Wall Street back on even footing along with the economy. 一九零七年十月二十二日，财政部长从华盛顿来到摩根的图书馆。摩根告诉财长，立即注资两千五百万美元，以增加流动性。当储户能从银行取到钱的时候，恐慌就会散去。在这种危急的时候。所有人都不由自主地臣服于这个当时全世界最有能力的银行家，尽管他已经是一个七十岁的老人。He summoned the leaders of another about eight or ten banks to meet in this room right next door here, and he locked the door. They wouldn't let them out until they agreed to come up with some capital to help ease the panic. 要彻底结束这场危机。摩根还需要一大笔资金，而且要快。他把银行家们锁在这间书房里讨论，自己在办公室里等待结果。这些银行家不愿借钱给要倒闭的企业，可是见死不救就会引起市场的恐慌，那将是一场无法挽救的金融骚乱。Finally, at about four o'clock in the morning, Morgan walked into the room, and then he had a statement for them to sign. Morgan directed the presidents of the companies by the sleeve and drew him over to a table, put the piece of paper down on the table, and said, "There's the place, King, and here's the pen." He handed him the pen and made this guy sign, and then everybody else signed. 最后，银行家们同意出两千五百万美元去解救这场危机。摩根用个人的力量控制住了一九零七年的金融危机，使它没有。长时间持续，也没有造成巨大损失。他是自亚历山大·汉密尔顿以来，华尔街上另一个有着巨大影响力的强势人物。他在1907年应对危机的措施，深远地影响着美国今天的金融体系。但是很快。美国人就为在他们的国家里，一个私人银行家拥有了如此大的权力而感到害怕。一九一三年，摩根去世。九个月后，美国国会立法，批准设立美国联邦储备系统。从此，美国又有了中央银行。在此后的近一百年时间里，美联储在货币调控中所承担的职能，在一步步的转移和分化着经济权力。它被美国政府逐步授权，成为了一个强大的监管者。这也持续引发着华尔街的忧虑和追问。So we're not a free market then. There is an invisible. There is a benevolent hand. That touches us. Absolutely, you're quite correct. To the extent that there is a central bank governing the amount of money in the system, that is not a free market, and most people call it regulation. And that was the problem. Instead of letting the market work, and clean out mistakes, and start over, that's what this is all about. That's what markets are supposed to do. Government can tell you what's legal, but the Industry itself can tell you what's ethical, what's a good business practice.
，一八零四年，杰斐逊已经成为了美国的第三任总统，而汉密尔顿则淡出了美国政坛。这年夏天，就在这条河上，汉密尔顿划着船去对岸的新泽西州参加一场决斗。在决斗前，他在日记里写下：“将不会向对方开枪。”结果，对方的子弹击中了他的胸膛。四十七岁的汉密尔顿在第二天不治身亡。那是美国历史上最著名也是最神秘的一场决斗。汉密尔顿的死，让整个纽约一片悲伤。今天的华尔街，是被汉密尔顿的理想引渡过来的。汉密尔顿去世后的第五年，杰斐逊回到了阿巴拉契亚山脉中间的一个农庄。他一生对土地和劳作充满敬意。一八二六年七月四日。这天是《独立宣言》发表五十周年的纪念日。就在这天，八十三岁的杰斐逊静静地离开了。八年的总统生涯，微薄的薪水使他早已入不敷出。他是美国历史上第一位在贫困中去世的总统。二零零八年以来。华盛顿和华尔街，就像一对需要相互警惕的同行者，一起度过危机中的每一天，小心地寻找着走出去的道路。二零零九年九月十四日，这一天，是雷曼兄弟银行倒闭一周年的日子。就在这一天，美国第四十四任总统奥巴马。在华尔街纽交所对面的联邦大厅发表演讲。It's a privilege to be in historic federal hall. It was here more than two centuries ago that our first Congress served and our first president was inaugurated. It was here in the early days of the Republic that Hamilton and Jefferson debated. How best to administer a young economy and ensure that our nation rewarded the talents and drive of its people? And two centuries later, we still grapple with these questions. The questions made more acute in moments of crisis. One bank loan. 开凿了美国第一条人工运河，一只股票贯通了美国铁路网，一场战争背后隐藏着金融之手，一位资本巨人掌控产业并购。十九世纪华尔街成就了美国的光荣与梦想。敬请收看华尔街第四集《镀金时代